so this topic just came to me right now. <laughs> um, and we'll get into the origins of that in a second. But, I mean, you've already read the title. However, I want to be talking about uh, romanticizing mental illness, I guess. Romanticizing chaos. Romanticizing crazy. Um, all these things and more. Um, and, yeah, they overlap, kind of. It just depends on the terminology you want to give things. So, um, this, just, like I said, this topic just came to me like 30 seconds before filming this. Because uh, I had a different topic that I was like, oh, this is something I wanted to talk about for a couple of weeks, and I'll get into that today. But then, I made a note for myself last night because I was sitting here at the studio, and I had my laptop going with its like slideshow, and there was a quote on there, and it was by Bukowski, Charles Bukowski, beat poet, poet, um, and I'll read the quote to you. Um, where are we here? She's mad, but she's magic. There's no lie in her fire. Now, that quote was taken from a poem. Um, so it's taken out of the context it was in and put in this way. And there's... I mean, I had it on my screen for a reason. I liked the quote. Now, I, like... <laughs> Obviously, sometimes... I mean, this is the perfect example. Is like If you've ever seen 500 Days of Summer, um, I don't want to ruin it. It's, 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 it's an enjoyable film. But um, there's, a, there's like a before and after. There's like someone in love and then someone not in love. And all these... There's like a little montage of like five or six things that they, this person said. Like, oh, I love this thing about them. I love this thing about them. I love that thing about them. One of them was like, oh, I love that heart-shaped birthmark on her neck and then later it was like i hate that cockroach shaped splotch on on her neck um and so sometimes obviously circumstances and experiences change things and your perception of things and um might sour some things for you so this quote was something that i had i'd, I'd liked enough to keep it and then it made me think of something completely different when i saw it last night and I got upset, and I was just like, this is so stupid. And, and then it kind of led to, to this thing right now. Uh, it's something that I was going to write about, write a response to that quote. Um, she's mad, but she's magic. There's no lie in her fire. So I wish that it didn't have the she's mad part. Because, I mean, if you're not already aware, but I mean, when we're talking about, in this context of someone being mad, we're talking about crazy, insane, not... Um, mentally well or in this reality I guess I mean that's just a synonym like someone who's mad like we're not talking about anger we're talking about like insanity or crazy or whatever I, I hate using those words because they're too much it's almost like a slang it's too casual for like and too broad so I understand why we'd use it, but it's like, okay, we, we're probably talking about someone with a mental illness who doesn't experience reality the same way that people without that mental illness might be experiencing reality, which is a whole other topic, because then we could talk about perception is reality, and how everyone experiences it differently, so what is reality? Because there's not just one reality, right? Um, but anyway, we're talking about someone who... If you're talking about someone crazy, or you're insane, or whatever, just is basically experiencing and interpreting things so different than what might be factual or real, quote-unquote real, um, that we assign that label to them, which is too much of, like, an umbrella term and doesn't get specific enough. So I'm hesitant to use it. It just it sounds too unforgiving and not... Um, not allowing for much room in the way of empathy, I guess. But anyway, someone who's mad in this context, that's what we're talking about. So when we say she's mad, but she's magic, we're actually saying she's crazy, but she's magic. There's no lie in her fire. So I'll tell you my response to this first. When I Originally, I liked it because it's mostly the latter part, is that she's magic. That's nice. There's no lie in her fire. I mean, that's the part that's the best part. Because 
saying that just like she's maybe her fire, maybe I originally initially read that as, as passion, right? So someone who's really passionate and that's that's authentic, right? So saying that these things she's an authentic person who has passion, that is I like that. The problem is that when we talk about the word mad and we're talking about fire, fires are chaotic. Like how do you, you know, controlling a fire isn't something you think of like, oh, this is a controlled, like even if you have like, you've got planned forest fires in some places that need to happen in order to stimulate growth and stuff or seeds and stuff to come out, whatever. But like, you know, generally a fire is not something you plan or can, or that can be controlled easily. It's chaotic and it's, um, <laughs> it's destructive usually. Um, sometimes you can be like, oh, I've got like this fire burning within me because you're talking about passion but I mean yeah so I mean, there's there's different ways to interpret it but that's the part that I start to not like so beforehand there's that kind of thing and then the way that I read it this time I was thinking like no like why are we celebrating someone being quote-unquote crazy they're mad oh but they're magic yes there's some magic there there's some good things happening whether it be creativity or different types of beauty and like some magical moments that are wonderful but they come with this package of like insanity but it's worth it is what it's kind of saying and there's because there's no lie in her fire that she is authentically herself that that um and i'm only keep saying she because that's what this quote says in the context of the poem bukowski's talking about this woman that he has kind of a relationship with they've never had a physical relationship they've basically been pen pals she's also a poet but she was like dating like another poet and, like, he has this romantic yearning for her, um, but they've never been together in a traditional romantic relationship, um, a committed one or, or anything. They just, like, have this artistic relationship, but he has, like, a type of yearning. However, that part where he's talking about there's, you know, she's mad, but she's magic, there's no lie in her fire, was, like, it was part of... He was basically promoting her to, like, a publisher. It was him trying to, like, sell her as a poet... Being like you should, you should be interested in this artist because she's amazing, and she's authentic, and she's got a voice. So taken out of that context, it's read as like she, this woman, is so authentic, and yes, she's chaotic and crazy, but it's beautiful and magical because she's just truly herself. And I like authenticity, but my experiences as of late have changed how I see this quote and it's nice to revisit things with different contexts and to try and really get at the source of it um and and also understand your feelings better right this is why we do this why i do this um and, and i just thought like you know reading it in this way i'm just like man no let's not romanticize that like i think that See, and now that I'm talking about it, I feel differently. And I feel like I'm being too harsh, being upset. But at the same time, it's just... I don't want to romanticize that. And part of it is because my experience with the quote-unquote the mad, the crazy, the insane, or basically just mental illness, that that can, that can have a lot of negative consequences, a lot of negative effects, a lot of poor treatment, a lot of other things that, that could be abusive if that were in the context of a romantic relationship. Obviously, you can have mental health issues and have that under control to a degree and not be abusive or have these really negative outcomes. That's obviously a thing that can happen. So someone could be mad, like in quotes, or, or be not in this reality or they experience reality differently or however you want to word it, um, but would fit into the umbrella of like mental illness or being mad. Um, and still be stable enough with certain things that they're doing to try and balance their mental illness and be healthier and whatever else, and they can still be positive and loving and amazing and beautiful and all those things. But this is talking about chaos. This is talking about destruction. This is talking about madness and fire. And part of that fire, I think, is passion. Part of it is chaotic. Part of it, like, I'm just kind of deconstructing the quote here because it just goes into this broader thing of, like, you know, romanticizing. Like, I, I don't necessarily think this poem is doing that. Like I said, in the context of the poem, this person, like, Bukowski is trying to, like, sell this, this poet, basically, 
Um, I mean, he's talking about his relationship with her a bit and how he wants to be with her and he isn't. But also there's just this part where, where that little section where that quote comes from is him just trying to sell her as an artist to like a publisher. And so, but taken out of that context, it's like, oh, wow, like, isn't it wonderful and beautiful and magical that someone can be so authentically themselves? And yes, they're a little crazy, but it's okay. And that's the part I'm struggling with. Because I want to say, like, no, it's not okay. <laughs> like, it's, I mean, it is okay for someone to be who they are. You are who you are. And, and what can we do about that? You're still going to, like, there's no cure. You know what I mean? Like, if, if someone was schizophrenic, it's not like they're not schizophrenic anymore. I mean, if we could talk about John Nash, right? Like who basically logicked himself and reasoned with himself because he was able to do that with his schizophrenia. Um, I mean, I'm talking about John Nash, and there's a, mu a movie called A Beautiful Mind, which is like a biopic of John Nash, which is somewhat accurate to his life. But basically, he's portrayed in that movie as logicking... He was a math mathematician, uh, as logicking himself out of schizophrenia. And he had hallucinations, and he sees people, and he had relationships with these people that didn't exist... And he was experiencing a different reality. And um, he was able to just be like, those people aren't real. I know they're not real. And I'm not going to engage with them anymore. And he ended up taking medication as well. And so he was able to balance, but he's still schizophrenic. You know what I mean? It didn't impact his life negatively anymore because he wasn't engaging with these constructions of his imagination and so it didn't affect his life negatively in that way. It didn't impact him that way. Like, he was on some medication, and he just also understood before the medication. He had this breakthrough of, like, these people aren't real. I'm just not going to talk to them. And he didn't. And he still saw them, you know, from time to time in his life, but was able to ignore them. So anyway, I'm just saying that you could be mad or whatever and still maintain positive relationships with people you would still have a certain mental illness and still be functional and balanced and and productive and positive and loving and all those things are definitely a possibility uh but i think romanticizing you know it's kind of like romantic there's this this, this thing i used to see all the time with like these scene scene type of um there's like there's just pictures of like scene kids with like you know like bleeding mascara type photos and it's like beauty in the breakdown was like a big thing and it's just like really though like is that what we're celebrating because i think what's worth celebrating or uplifting or talking about or or whatever is authenticity for sure is like, hey, we can talk about mental illness, we can talk about mental health, we can whatever, and that we should be striving to do what we can to balance that and be the best we can be and not ignore it, not ignore those things, but just like acknowledge that, hey, this is something that I live with or this is something that's a real thing that people struggle with and acknowledge what it is, acknowledge that it exists and say that you're dealing with it like or you're authentically you that you're not ignoring you're like hey this is a part of who i am whether it be anxiety it's not one not to be used as an excuse for your behavior it could be a reason for some of your behavior but also you recognize in the fullness of the authenticity of like that these aren't necessarily great behaviors possibly or these symptoms or whatever they are and that unfortunately that's just where you're at maybe and you want to do better or whatever i'm going off the rails of course but it's just like the way I just realized, like, that, the way that that quote was, like, framed, I think I know what they were trying to do. And maybe, again, it's my interpretation. Someone else might interpret it differently. And I interpreted it slightly differently beforehand. Whereas now, I'm, like, bitter about it when I see it, which is just, that's a signifier of where I'm at right now. And talking about this helps me see things in a, in a fuller picture and to appreciate it in its entirety. One, it made me research the poem. Um, I have, like, uh definitive version or a definitive um book of Bukowski's poems but it doesn't include that poem and I haven't read the whole thing anyway but I looked for it in there and I didn't have it I can't remember the name of the poem right now uh it says like an almost made up poem I think is what it's called an almost made up poem um it's pretty short anyway uh 
yeah, so it made me research the context to give this thing a fuller appreciation for what it is and what it isn't and what it could be and what it may not be, right? Um, I just think, like, this topic just can go so broad, but I just think that obviously trying to... Okay, so let me backtrack here. Not backtrack. Let me just... An aside. There's a book on anxiety that I read, and it's called First We Make the Beast Beautiful. And it's... Yeah. I understand what they're trying to do. It's kind of presented in this basic way that makes me cringe a little bit. But I think that the spirit of it is like, first we have to say, we, we say like, hey, I have anxiety. Th these are the positive things that anxiety can bring me. Let's look at those traits. Let's look at those things and try to find all the positive things we can in there. And then we can maybe deal with the symptoms and negative outcomes or whatever and try to like tame those negative symptoms as much as we can and learn to work with them to make them positives, whatever, like whatever you have weaknesses and you can try to make them into strengths. It's something that you can just do whether you have a label or not for whatever you're experiencing as, as a mental health issue or not. Um, you can take weaknesses and sometimes make them strengths. And sometimes you just have to cope with those weaknesses as best you can or learn to balance them or just get like, uh, there's only a certain amount you can get better with some things and that's good to acknowledge too. But like, celebrating chaos and destruction is one of those things that happens sometimes with mental illnesses or or just in general like i don't know i just see that a lot and sometimes the spirit of it is really like this is who i am so i don't know it's kind of like that oh man did i talk about that before i think i did i should link to that at the end of this um that marilyn monroe quote that's like if you can't have me, if you don't, or if you can't tolerate me at my worst, you can't have me at my best. And it's like, why would, what? Like, again, I understand the spirit of that, but it's like, it's, it, it always had this like sassy, um, undertone to it. That's like, I'm allowed to be my worst and you should be able to like, tolerate like i don't know being at your worst like anyone's worst is not some place that they should want to be or romanticize it should be something that's just like hey sometimes i you know i make mistakes and i'm not perfect and whatever but like i'm always striving to do better and that piece is what's missing from these type of pseudo like i don't know what to call them quote these quotes like that part is what's missing when you romanticize these these negative aspects like, I think that being authentic, being transparent, talking about mental health is something that's been on the rise in the past couple of years, which I find to be really good. I find that that transparency, that discussion, that open conversation, um, educational aspects to that of people, including myself, being way more understanding, empathetic, and more educated and informed about issues is great. But that involves way more than just a one-liner that's like, yeah, her destruction and chaos and whatever is beautiful. It's like, is it? Or or is it really not? And and it's just like that that whole package, like I mean, that's the other thing you have to understand about about this background is like Bukowski was horribly I mean, he was just a horrible person in a lot of regards with his romantic relationships and to himself and just like him being an alcoholic mixed with these other mental health issues and like things that he didn't really whatever and you could say like all oh, this great poetry came out of it that's great and so we romanticize like artists in that aspect a lot of times too or even as an artist i see a quote floating around every once in a while what's bad for your heart is good for your art and it's like depending on how you read that it's like that whole that whole to tortured artist thing is like would i still be able to produce good art or like comics think about this too like if i'm not angry anymore can I still be funny? Or if I don't have like this, what if I deal with all my like issues, could I still be funny? Or like as an artist that, that maybe is using it as a cathartic process, could I still make this this good art if I have reconciled with those issues? And it's like, yes, I think you can and you should try to do that. And yes, if you're using art as a cathartic process, then what's bad, like these negative experiences you have, you can turn that into a positive, that's good. But if you just look at it in that frame of like, hey, it's good to have bad things happen or it's good to have these horrible experiences or like it's good to be crazy because you make amazing things or it's like same thing with drug use, right? That's like a thing that's like, man, it, people say that my music or my art isn't good when I'm clean. 
And, but when I'm on heroin and whatever, and I'm horrible at being a human and existing and having good relationships with people, my art's better, but it suffers when I'm clean. Like, I don't, like, I understand that to a degree. And obviously I think that you need to try and, and figure out a way to be the best you you can be while also making the best art that you can. And maybe you change some things about that. But anyway, that's the problem with these like one-liner, out of context things that is like celebratory or trying to romanticize like being chaotic, destructive, crazy, mad, someone being at their worst and this being, and it's just like, again, there's like that hint of some things of like sass or that hint of like, this is okay. And it's like, well, some like, is it okay? Like, what does that mean? Because what's behind that? What's behind that madness? What's behind that chaos of a fire? Like, what is behind that? And when you start to ask those questions, it's like, okay, if we apply that to really specific things that could happen in that relationship, that's not okay. And we shouldn't be celebrating that. We should be talking about things and wanting to celebrate or romanticize. No, see, romanticizing anything is where we fall into a problem um, to a degree because that whole thing about romanticizing something is that it's it's already something that isn't inherently a beautiful positive thing that's why you are romanticizing it some like you know what i mean it's not like oh you're really romanticizing i don't know what's something that's inherently good you know what i mean like romanticizing being in love like being in love is already something that's like you know, it'd be redundant. So it's like romanticizing drug use to be like, okay, because drug use, you just see as a bad thing. And that gets romanticized in, in art and movies and songs and whatever. Right. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, that's, I don't know. That was a weird one, but I mean, it, like whatever, there's a fullness that I want to bring to this. And I guess it's also talking about like analysis and being analytical and like asking why. And like, I, I like, I would like to do that more often because when someone just spouts something off, like, again, I saved that picture. I saved that quote and I had it come up and then it hit me in a different way this time to the point where I wanted to really look at it and extract it because it hit me in a way that I was like, no, Bukowski, get out of here, like, whatever. And then I wanted to look up what it was like in the context of the full fullness of the poem. I didn't even know it came from a poem at first. It could have been from an interview or something else. But it's from a poem, and, uh, yeah. Anyway, I think that's all I have to say about that. Like, I feel like the latter half of this is just so obvious, or all of it is so obvious that, like, whatever. But for some people, maybe it's not. Like, there's just a difference between being transparent and, and open and discussing things like mental health and celebrating it's okay to be a shit person because I have a diagnosis. Um, different things. Anyway... See you in another time.